I was a scoutmaster at the time, and I had about a half a dozen young men in my scouts that didn't have a dad in their, in their life, didn't have a grandpa in their life, and I took them fishing one weekend. And then they really wanted to, to learn, and I said, look, I said, I can't take you every weekend. So I started editing junky videos on, on little fishing techniques, and my Boy Scouts would go watch it. Well, I just, just started to grow. That was the start, was I had a bunch of kids that just wanted to learn how to fish, and there was nobody out there teaching anymore. From his home in Rome, Georgia, Gene Jensen, better known as the Fluke Master, has built one of the largest fishing tutorial channels on YouTube. With his motto of teaching the world to fish, he has become one of the most successful YouTubers in the fishing community, with over 335,000 subscribers. On this episode, we cover everything from local reservoirs such as Rocky Mountain, Hard Labor, Varner, to tips and strategies on making better fishing videos and building your channel. From kayak fishing to the big lakes, this episode is loaded with information. If you enjoy videos like these, hit that subscribe button and click that bell so you'll be notified of any future content. And follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Fish North Georgia. Now let's get started. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we got a special treat for you today, Mr. Gene Jensen, a.k.a. the Fluke Master. How you doing? I'm doing pretty good. We appreciate you driving out here to uh, see us and spend a few minutes with us today. Oh, yeah. It's, it's, I love it up here. I moved from Augusta, Georgia to Rome, Georgia, just to be up in the mountains and be you know close to some pretty stuff. So, yeah, I love it up here. So, you're familiar with Barry College? Very much so. I live right over, over the mountain from it. I've got a daughter that's attending Barry right now. Oh, cool. That's awesome. Maybe you can leave me a few bucks to help pay for it. <laughs> it, it is not a cheap no, school. No, it's not. <laughs> it is not. So... Thank goodness for uh, financial aid. Yeah, like that's, that. that's true. Um, first off, the name Fluke Master. Uh-huh. How did it come to be? Oh, goodness. You remember back in the forum days, um, the Bass Fishing homepage. Uh-huh. Um, and then a couple other forums, Bass Resource, so on and so forth. But it was Bass Fishing homepage was the first one I ever found. Uh, and that was like in 2003, 2004. Right. And I uh, had to come up with a screen name. And I was in the process of learning how to, to fish a fluke from the bank. And it wasn't the super fluke. It wasn't the little junior. It wasn't any. It was the regular fluke. And I was catching the snot out of fish. And so I, I had to come up with a name. I'm like, and this was a period of time in, in forums where guys were just calling themselves bat. And, you know, you got Ed Bassmaster on YouTube. He was calling himself Ed Bassmaster back then. Right. And then, and so everybody was something master. So I was like, yeah, I just call myself Luke Master. Threw it on there, and then I just kept using it every web, every uh, form I'd sign up for. And then I got into um, Bass Resource, became on staff there for ten years. Right. And um, and my name was still Fluke Master, so it stuck. Gotcha. You know, my original channel name was the Fishing Partner. Oh, really? Okay. And. All of my buddies and fans over on Bass Resource told me, asked me what the heck I was thinking. You know, the, my, my brand was Fat Fluke Master. Right. And so I changed it and it stuck and I can't get away from it is the reason it's still Fluke Master. And that's it. Well, it, it, it has worked. <laughs> it has. It has worked well for you. Um, how many subscribers are you up to now on YouTube? I don't know. Um, I don't see track. It's 300,000 plus. 330 something thousand or something like okay. that. Okay. Yeah. So, but the Fluke Master is the perfect name for 330 something thousand people so. to go. So <laughs> it's very good. Now, before we get into some other stuff, we've noticed that you are a rabid Georgia Bulldog fan. Oh, uh, yeah. And then some. <laughs> and then some. Is that okay? Uh, in fact, Josh showed me a picture, and I don't know, it was 10 years of Georgia Bulldog hats or something uh -huh. like that that you have worn. So. Yeah. We're going to go ahead and, you know, we're going to assume that they're going to whip tech. Yeah, I'm hoping. And you're hoping. I don't know anything could happen, but let's yeah. go ahead and assume that. And let's talk about Jordan and LSU for a second. What do you uh, think? You didn't expect that question today, No, did you? you know what? Me and Jordan, my, my son who's sitting here in the in the studio, we he's a, a big sports fan. He can tell right. you stats upon stats of anybody in any sport. So um, we've been talking about it, and we really feel like uh, that Georgia's holding out a lot of plays. Okay. And we think that Fromm has been – they've been uh, sending plays to Fromm that he's not comfortable with, and they're not showing their cards for LSU, and they're not showing their cards for – um, for national championship if they make it that far. Right. They've been throwing a few odd plays in there, like the sweep right and the sweep right, left that you don't see very often. Just to, They've been throwing these oddball plays in there you don't normally see, and you're like, wait a minute. And so that's kind of the way we feel. I, we feel like nobody has seen their cards yet. 
Gotcha. And we'll see what they can do with LSU. From he, it, it's just it's odd to see him play that way. Okay. The la- over the last three games, but I think it's because they're just holding their cards tight and they're playing, making plays that he's not comfortable with. So we got a little conspiracy theory kind of going. And, well, there. yeah, but Alabama's done it for years, and you see, you know, you see all these teams doing it, right? And so it's just one of those things that I got you. Okay, well, you still think they'll beat LSU? I think it's going to be a really good game. I think they're going to beat LSU by three points. Three points. High score and low score? Uh, middle of the road. Middle 20, of the road. 20, 21, somewhere around there. Okay. Because the defense, Georgia's defense is firing on all cylinders. Well, see, that's the one thing I've been telling everybody. The yep. defense is going to win that game for them. Yep. You know. But, of course, they, they may pull out some offensive stuff like you're talking about. Yeah, we'll so. see. We'll see. But, yeah, I, I love watching their defense. Because, you know, two years ago their defense was horrible. Their, their secondary was just the worst of the worst two and right. three years ago. So it's been good to watch them mature and get better and better. So. And that with with a defensive minded coach, that's the way it should be. Yeah, and I was a defensive player in all sports I played. So was, I if you. they can't score, you don't lose. That's true. <laughs> that's true. So I got you. Okay. So with every bit of success, there's always a beginning. Yep. So let's go back to your childhood. Do you have uh, your earliest memory of fishing or anything that stands out to you? Yeah, I can tell you about my first fish. I feel Absolutely. like it was yesterday. Yeah, um, yeah. We were on vacation. Now, I'm the seventh of eight children. And so the only uh, in the 80s, the early late 70s, early 80s was the, the big, great recession. And so um, my father uh, went and sold our van, sold another car or traded it in, came back home with two identical Volkswagen diesel rabbits. Okay. And yeah, we, I remember those. we would load all the kids into those two rabbits and travel everywhere. So we traveled up to... Uh, Covington, Virginia, where we used to live. Um, and dad had a little piece of property that he had bought years before and we would, uh, fish there. And so it was kind of what a normal little vacation. We'd stay in a little cabin on a Creek called Craig's Creek Mm -hmm. up in Covington, Virginia. And we'd fish for red eye bass. And is that what we would call a shoal bass here? Uh, is it a little bit different? They're a little different. Okay. Um, and, and so it, I actually, the shoal bass and red ba- red eye bass are, are considered different species here in Georgia as well. Okay. You can catch them up this from here northeast. You can catch red eye bass in the creeks and the rivers, and a little bit you can catch them on the Etowah River, um, uh, out uh, just north of Rome or just west of Rome, or east of Rome. Gotcha. And so, but and so we would go catch helgramites. Right. Which at, at three and four years old, I was scared to death of. Absolutely. They're ugly. Yep. And so me and my dad went down the road. We left where the cabin was. We would catch them behind the cabin. We'd, we'd go down the road and we went into, there's, there was this little slick rock that went down into the creek and he was, had his, he never got on a boat with me. He loves to have his knees in the water. So he was in the water and I was next to him and I threw out and I caught, I hooked into a fish. And I remember I was scared to death to touch that thing. I think I was four, maybe four and a half. Right. And uh, and so he came came out with me, and I drug that thing up on the rock, and I remember him grabbing it, and we didn't have cameras or anything else back then. But right. that was it, man. I was That was the first fish I ever caught in my life. And and from then on out, my dad and I were trout fishermen up here in North Georgia. I knew these roads, these back roads, and these creeks like the back of my hand. Right. Um, and I spent 16, 17, 18 years old driving up here, sleeping in my car, trout fishing. Really? Yeah, I mean, right up here in Tacoa, up in up in uh, at uh, Cooper's Creek and Dick's Creek, and I mean, uh, all those. I spent my whole teenage life coming up here fishing. So, so, so at what point did you get into bass fishing? Uh, I did a little bit when I was a teenager because okay. my, my best friend was a bass fisherman. Gotcha. Um, and when they opened up Charlie Elliott, mm-hmm. uh, which was twenty minutes from my house, um, that's when it started. And I, I remember Charlie Elliott when all the brush was in the pockets and floating and they had trees laid down, c- cabled down with concrete blocks underneath them. And you could throw through those pockets and catch them on spinnerbaits all day long. And I mean, it, I, I, I love Charles Elliott. Gotcha. And, uh, and it was before Clybell or the new wildlife center was there or anything else. It right. was just the lakes and a couple of buildings. And it was a lot of fun. Is it safe to say that your dad would have been your biggest influence on your fishing oh, easily. early. Yeah, he's well, he's my hero in everything, really. That's awesome. Yeah, you know, absolutely. You know, when he passed away a couple of years ago, actually when he got diagnosed with Parkinson's, I I sat down with him. We had a little, good long conversation. And now I've been in the medical field for 20 years and I, I knew what all that entailed. Right. And we talked about how it was going to be a horrible way to die and all that other stuff that and me and my dad were a lot closer than my my other brothers and sisters were to him cuz we did everything together. Right. And so we had good conversations and we talked about fishing and stuff like that and to this day, he's never been on a boat with me. 
Never. Really? To the day he died. He wanted to. By the time he, he realized that he needed to go fishing with me, he was already un, too unstable to get on the boat. Right. And I, and I smacked him in the back of the head for it, but that's all right. I, I, don't, well, I don't judge him for it. I understand that. I, yeah. I <laughs> he, was, he was in the Navy during the Korean War, and he spent three years on a ship without getting off. And it was a LST, which is in, in, in uh, they call it a large, slow target. Right. Because it's like a big John boat that carries tanks. Mm. And so it's a horrible ride, and he was the radio. He fixed radios, and he was an electrician on the boat, so he never could get off. And uh, and so he never went. I didn't. I didn't see the ocean until I was sixteen and could drive there myself. But, but he, you can understand why. Now. Oh, yeah. I totally understand why. So yeah, he. So we spent our whole time up in the mountains, just you know, pounding trout. I got you. Yeah. So you mentioned you're in the medical field mm -hmm. still. No. Mm -mm. Okay. What did you do? I was. A sh I shot X-rays in the army. Uh, got out of the army after six years and worked at Medical College of Georgia Trauma Center on weekends for fifteen, and uh, okay, and loved every minute of that. That was a lot of fun. Did you do any other type of fishing with your dad other than trout fishing? No. Okay, so that's what he'd love to do. Yep. Yeah. When most of the kids were out of the house, then we had the money, or he had the money to take us. I was a seventh of eight, so he had the money to take us out west. We would go to Henry's Fork and. Gotcha. And grandma had a, a friend that owned a house on Henry's Fork and they charge us 25 bucks a week to stay there. And, you know, it was fun. I noticed in one of your videos that you mentioned, and I want to say it was about 14, 15 years old that you started getting the desire to teach. Yep. So kind of explain how that is. Is that something that your dad instilled in you? Yeah, dad That's was it. dad was a, a great orator. You know, the, gotcha. the, you know, the, the, the horrible thing about the disease that he had was that it affects your ability to speak. And so to watch him go from, from where he was to where, you know, to not being able to speak anymore was rough on him, rough on me and, you know, everything else. But he, uh, um, he, through his way of teaching, um, it helped me to understand he never put himself above me. Mm -hmm. Um, and so as I was teaching my, uh, youth groups or my scouts, or I was a scout master for, you know, in the scouts, I wasn't, I'm not all 25 years was I a scout master, but I was involved with scouting for 25 years. And I always remembered that. And, and it almost, it became second nature where I don't ever put myself above anybody else. I, and I'm, and it's a God given ta gift to be able to teach at somebody's level. And not, you know, I, and I'm not any better than anybody else. I'm still learning. Right. And so that's kind of how I feel. And that's how I teach is that I just want everybody to know the information and I'm not good at it. <laughs> I, you know, you. I know how to get, I know how to tell it and I'm not always good at catching fish on it. Well, that, that leads to my next question. In your mind, what makes a great teacher? Um, at any level. It, it, it has more to do with humility than anything, because I've seen good teachers, and I've seen really bad ones, and it is usually those bad ones that are talking. And that may just be because of the way I am, but I see these, and I'm like, man, he's just talking down to them, or he's talking to people like he's like they're kindergartners or you know that kind of stuff. That dry, I can't watch people that teach like that. And there's some great teachers out there that have all the information, even on YouTube, that talk to you like you're in kindergarten. Right. And I'm like, no, that's that just, I can't watch it. It drives me nuts. I don't watch fishing videos. Oh, really? That's uh, interesting. I, I, very, unless I'm doing research on something that I don't know much about. I'll right. go in and look at some wired to fish videos or stuff like that that have a little bit of information when I'm still trying to teach myself. But, gotcha. Yeah. So my next question was, what should a teacher not do? And I think you, that's you, it. you covered one, <laughs> but any other advice, if you're, if you're trying to, you know, what would be a mistake that you see other than talking down, maybe as far as maybe the way they give information or something like that? Um, gosh, money. I, I don't know. I, that's the, that's the one that irritates me the most. Everything else is, it, it, you can, it can ease. I mean, you can easily get over. Right. Is my thought. Um, so getting the ego out of the way. Getting the ego out of the way. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. And, what, and what we're really, in the fishing world, what we're bad at is keeping secrets. That was my very next question. That's, <laughs> that was my very next question. I'm glad you ended that. You know, you're not very secretive. No. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, a guest we had on earlier, Jimbo, from Jimbo yep. Lanier, one of the things he, he stressed was tell the truth, tell them what's really going on. And, yeah. and we noticed that about you. Well, so. I, I always tell my, my fishing buddies, don't ever give me your secret spots. You know, don't ever tell me your secrets, uh, because my job is to tell the world information. Yep. And, and, but there is a few, like there was a bait a few years ago that like greenfish tackle the guys and they, they're in Augusta. They've all, they're all buddies of mine. 
and they had this bait called the creeper and I wanted to make a video on it because I had just slayed fish on it. And they were like, hold off. We're winning tournaments on it right now. Just wait. And they made me wait for three years. Really? To do a bait, to a, do a video on that bait. And I'm like, man. So on the third year, I made the video and it was, you know, it was okay. But yeah, they were all winning local tournaments and a lot of money on that dang little bait. On that little bait. Yeah. What exactly is a creeper? It's like a, it's, it's like an archy head, shaky head. Mm-hmm. It's got a large archy head. Um, it's got a light wire hook. You put a, a Zoom uh, Ultra Vibe Speed Crawl on there early in the spring when their fish are just pulling up on the points and getting ready to, to go back and spawn, and you just creep it along the bottom. Um, Will, uh, the, uh, the one of the owners, mm -hmm. uh, won the Northern uh, Bass Open that got him into the Bassmasters Classic a couple years ago, won it catching smallmouth on a creeper head. Okay. I and he was you. fishing right next to Ike and Ellie during that tournament. They were sharing spots. Right. And he beat Ike and Ellie with it. And it's it's not and – it, and it's just a different look. It's a shaky head, but it's also just the one that you just kind of drag on the bottom when you're on a hard bottom. And, uh, you know, they're not sponsors of mine, I just, but they're just buddies. And, uh, yeah, I, 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 I will keep a secret, but I, just not, I want to tell the world about everything. <laughs> well, another question I got is we're talking about teaching, but what makes a good student? You know, I keep looking at my comments for over the over these years. Right. There's, um, and I get a lot of criticism, and there's those that have constructive criticism. Those who have, uh, somebody asks questions is a good student. Right. Okay. Someone who asks a follow up question and stuff like that. That's why I'm really animate on going in and reading all my comments, and the ones I I need to respond to, I respond to. The ones that I just need to say hi, thanks. I either say thanks or I hit the little heart button that they have now that I can just it right. just saves a lot of time. And so, um, so yeah, one that'll ask questions and one that won't be so critical. You can't come, come into one of my videos thinking you already know everything. Right. Cause you're not going to learn the details. And I love teaching the details. You're going to already say, Oh, I already know that. Beep, go on to the next video. Right. But somewhere in that video will be something you don't know. Yeah. Gotcha. And, and that's one thing I've, and I've always tried to, to put into every one of my videos is that one little tidbit of. One little bullet of information you may not have known, you know, so. I got you. Any advice for someone who is just starting out fishing as an adult or maybe a parent teaching a child to fish for the first time from a teaching standpoint? Patience. Patience. Especially parents teaching children. I got four of them. I know how hard it is. And you can have all the patience in the world. They're still going to push every single button you got. I got you. Um, and, uh, you know, and I have a really good video. Me and my wife sat down on the back porch of a cabin up in Tennessee one time, made a video about how to teach kids how to fish. And we talked about leaving your stuff at home, taking only the kids' stuff, and you are their guide and you are their teacher. You put the you, you do what you need to do to make sure they have a hard, have a good time. And the most important thing is when they say they're bored the second or third time, pack up and go home. Okay. And then it, that, that length will get longer and longer. Don't ever try to force, not even just a kid, but anybody you're teaching, don't ever force them to stay out. You know, try to encourage them to stay a little longer, but that's about it. You know, when my kids say, Dad, I'm bored, and we got, let's go home, then it, I pack up and go home, you know. Well, I've noticed with the amount of followers and subscribers that you have, apparently what you're teaching or the way you're teaching is working. So, and also in doing that, it seems to me that you are attracting sponsors as well during this time. Yep. So maybe we'll take this time. Maybe you can talk about some of your sponsors and, and how they help you in doing what you do. Yeah. Um, first of all, there's a lot of guys out there wanting to get sponsors right. through okay, this kind right. of stuff. And one thing I learned the hard way is just make yourself valuable. And the sponsors will come. Gotcha. You know, I got really frustrated with trying to find sponsors when I knew what I was doing was right. And I knew what I was going to, what I was doing was going to eventually grow. I just needed a little financial help doing it and couldn't do it. And I got really frustrated. And, and, uh, and so actually Mark Zona helped me get through that. So okay. he's, he has become a good friend of mine through other channels. And so he helped me help talk me through that frustration. So it's kind of helps a lot, but I've got great sponsors. Now I've got good kayak sponsors like in bonafide kayaks and, and, uh, and bending branches, paddles and NRS PFDs or, or NRS gear. Um, especially this winter that NRS, you know, NRS makes anti-exposure suits. Okay. So if I want to kayak when it's 40 degree water. I don't, I can go kayak. I don't have to worry about 
if I fall in the water, am I going to survive? Gotcha. I fall in the water, I can get back in my boat and I'm dry. And so they, you know, they, they make their top of the line stuff anyway. But my, the one sponsor I've had the most is 13 fishing. Okay. And I don't believe they're the best rods and reels on the market. I won't be the one to tell you that. I will tell you straight up. They are the best deal on the market, but they're not, uh, you know, they, they, they make great rods. They make great reels at great prices, great prices. And that's the biggest thing is I don't want to use a $400 rod and a $500 reel because that's not what my viewers are going to want to exactly. use either. So you got to be genuine. Oh, uh, yeah, and exactly. I love $80 to $100 rods. Now, I do have some of their $180 and $200 rods, but that's usually because they've sent it to me to test or to break. Or right. My job is to break their gear, and I'm really good at it. <laughs> <laughs> they, at the end of the year, I, I need send, that job right there. Exactly. I think I could do that. <laughs> well, at the end of the year, I send them all my reels, and then they send me new ones, but they break down all those reels, and they look and see where they wore, where they, you know, what they need to do. I got dinner. you. Okay. I keep track of whether I clean the reel and grease it and do it all myself. Some of them I do. Some of them I don't. And so they're really, really meticulous, and they know that I spend 200 days a year fishing, and they know I'm really good at breaking their stuff. And so we can definitely, I mean, I've figured out how to break everything they've got. I got and you. It's, and it's great because then they go and they, they fix their, their problems, and, they, and it's, it's just fun. You know, they're, they're a great sponsor. I absolutely love being with them. That's awesome. So. And that, that's the kind of, you know, I wanted to lead in. You, you have a teaching aspect on one side. Mm -hmm. You have sponsorship on the other side. Now, at some point, you have to mesh the two, oh, man, yeah. and you have to be genuine doing it. So that was my next question. If if somebody's watching you and they say, okay, well, I'm fishing 13, you know, fish or what was the name? I'm yeah, sorry. 13 fishing. 13 fishing. And they're going to say, yeah, well, he's just saying that because. <laughs> How do you bring about the genuineness of, you know, what you're trying to teach with the sponsorships? Well, there's nothing more important than my integrity to gotcha. me. You Absolutely. Know, well, God, family, integrity is how it works for that's me. That, and that's a good order. And so... My, my integrity, I have, I have left $35,000 deals because a company asked me to lie about their product. Gotcha. I mean, walked out the door and said, honey, we're just going to have to figure out how to make it up because I can't be with them anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm that kind of a person. I don't care about the money. You know, my, I tell all my sponsors, you're not paying me. You're paying my wife to let me do this. That's a good way to look at it because that's probably the truth. It is absolute <laughs> truth. If I can't pay the bills and can't feed my family, right. she ain't happy and it don't work. That might be the smartest thing I've heard <laughs> on a podcast yet because that's the truth. So I would do it for free. I literally right. would do it for free. And uh, and the, the, the move to do this full time was the scariest thing I've ever done. But for, for sponsorship stuff, I, I don't care what it is i don't care how much money they're paying me i just and and it drives my wife nuts because she's like well why don't you just do, do, do we need a little extra money for you know a little extra money for christmas and this i'm like no i said it'll it'll all come it'll all work itself out you know i, I don't worry about that stuff so that's uh that might be some of the smartest <laughs> stuff i've heard I, that, that's great so Let's get into the video aspect of what you do because that is pretty much where your success is coming from mm hmm what makes a great tutorial video? And that's pretty much Ooh, what you sponsor. Like sponsor, might, uh, you specialize. That might be word. talking yeah. about some of my secrets, but they're not really secrets anymore. But right. to, to, to do anything uh, instructional, you've got to answer certain questions. Right. And, I, and when I do an outline for any of my videos, I list, I put the words what, where, when, and how on there. And if I can answer what you use, where you use it, when you use it, and how you use it, I got a good video. Gotcha. I just got to answer those questions. And, that, and that's how every one of my, if you look on my notes on my, on my iPhone, all of them have what, where, when, and how, and they're all okay. answered. That sounds very easy. <laughs> but there's a lot of people out there that put out a what, when, where, and how uh -huh. video, and they're not having 300,000 plus subscribers. No. So there's something you're doing a little different. Um, I'm not. I'm not too shabby at talking to a camera that's not talking back. That's one thing. I would got gotcha. you. And, uh, but uh, the other thing is just have your have your information there with you. Uh, my best videos, and I don't do that. I need to do more notes, more outlines. My best videos are when I do outlines and sit down and do it. You know, gotcha. Um, the hardest thing is getting those little green fish to cooperate with my video. We're learning that. Yep. And so there's there's a few things I'm going to change different. I won't talk about it, but I'm going to do a little bit different this next year to right. to to make it a little bit easier on me. And to free up some time for me and family. Gotcha. 
Um, and, uh, and they will change a little bit, but it's still going to be the same. Let's throw as much information as I can out there about each subject and, and just roll with it. I'm going to redo a lot of my old videos too, because I've got some really old ones that need to be redone. And, uh, and so, and then there's some other like fish finder videos are going to be a priority this year because not anybody's doing it, you know, at least not. And I'm not good at it. I I can tell you what a bass looks like on a fish finder and I can tell you how to read maps. I'm 90% map reading is what my fishing is. Gotcha. You know, and that comes from 15 years of Clark's Hill fishing, you know, offshore for, for blueback herring bass, you know, it's right. And so, but, uh, do you remember your first video? Uh, yeah, I do. And what was that one? Um, I was trying to prove a point. I was trying to convince the owner of Bass Resource that the world was moving from forums to, to video. And this was when YouTube was about a year old. And I said, look, I said, this is coming. And, and he says, well, no, and it's, it's, well, actually, YouTube is probably a year and a half old. And so I said, okay. I said, I'm going to make a video, and I'll show you what's, what's going to happen. And I'm going to pick a topic that everybody on YouTube's already done, and it's how to put a hook in a worm. Gotcha. And I said, I'm going to do it my way. And so I literally, it was just bare bones basic. I put a camera on a tripod and I stood and I pointed the camera down at the table and I slammed my hands up underneath the camera and I started showing how to put, put a hook in the worm. But the difference was every other video on YouTube at the time had how to put a EWG, an extra wide gap hook, into a worm and that was it. And I said, and I did an EWG, I did a straight shank, I did a regular offset worm hook because they all get hooked different. And I did all that and I put it on YouTube and it got picked up by like seven or eight blogs and a whole bunch. And everybody's like, that's the best dang. And it's just my ugly hand sitting there th- right. putting a hook on a worm. But it was information. But it was the information. And he still didn't believe me. And I went on, I, that's when I told my wife, you know what, he's going to either going to lead, follow or get out of my way because I'm going to go do this. And I went and did it on my own. So yeah, that, that was my next question was the decision to put your stuff on a YouTube platform. And I was going to ask how or why, but I, I think you just actually answered that. It, that was the start. That was my first video, but that wasn't the reason why. Okay. The reason why was because I was a scout master at the time mm-hmm. and I had about a half a dozen young men in my scouts that didn't have a dad in their, in their life, didn't have a grandpa in their life. And I took them fishing one weekend and I worked weekends at the hospital. So I t- took off we went camping. Actually, we went to Charlie Elliott. So from Augusta to Charlie Elliott, we spent a couple of days. Tried to kill one of them because I didn't realize he was that allergic to, to pollen. <laughs> <laughs> and it was right in the middle of, of pine pollen season. So I had to, had to Benadryl him and send him back home. But anyway, uh, so I had a bunch of boys that fell in love with fishing, and they really wanted to, to learn. And I said, look, I said, I can't take you every weekend. And my kids were still very young. They weren't, you know, I, I think I had two kids at the time, maybe three. Um, I had three kids. And so uh, I told him, I said, look, I said, they've got this new YouTube thing that's, uh, you, I can, that hosts videos. And the only thing difference between it and the other sites was you didn't have to pay to put a video on YouTube at the time. Right. And so I said, okay, I'm going to start putting these videos up. Uh, I didn't know how to edit. I knew how to shoot pictures because I was a photographer in my yearbook in high school. And I, you know, I, I, I did uh, picture type stuff, not only x-rays, but we did uh, teledermatology when it was brand new. I was the pilot. Uh, tech for teledermatology back in the 90s okay uh, when I was in the army in early 2000s and so I knew how to take digital pictures and stuff like that so I taught myself how to shoot video and I taught myself how to edit using YouTube and uh, and so I started editing junky videos on on little fishing techniques and my boy scouts would go watch it well I just just started to grow and those first 20 videos are gone I deleted them because they were they were you know horrible quality right but uh Anyway, so so that was the start was I had a bunch of kids that just wanted to learn how to fish and there was nobody out there teaching anymore. You know, Bill Dance wasn't teaching anymore. He was doing, Hey, y'all watch this and Right, yeah. And and buy buy the my products my sponsors' products. Right. And every other uh T V show out there, because there weren't hardly any YouTube shows. Actually there weren't any. And so he was I was the only one doing it. You know, me and maybe Nick the informative fishing and fisherman out in California were the first two. And gotcha. so, yeah, and that was it. Well, that's a great story. Who knew that the Fluke Master <laughs> channel started out teaching Boy Scouts? Did teaching my Boy Scouts. And how quickly did you, we can bring teaching back into it, how quickly did it take for you to understand that this is a format that is so easy to teach with? It was pretty quick. Um, a year, year and a half when I realized that. The light bulb went off. Yeah, right. yeah, and that was the, man. I, I, and that's when I realized I just didn't want to quit. 
I wasn't making any money at it. My wife and I were still having the money arguments. I was spending more money on it than I was making. I didn't know you could make money in YouTube till I was doing it for two and a half, three years. Okay, right. And then that's when my buddy Ed Bassmaster started killing it on YouTube. And I was like, and he's a comedian if you don't know who he is. Right. And uh, he'd do prank videos and stuff like that. He was killing it. He went full time. And I was like, wait a minute, you can make money doing this? Exactly. <laughs> well, did you, did you even think at that time the amount of success that was possible? No. no, I'm way past where I thought was possible. Oh, I'm sure. I'm way, way. I didn't think I'd ever get 100,000 subscribers. I was just way past it. And so, uh, yeah, it's amazing to see what's going on now. It is. It's incredible. Yeah. So how about some mistakes you made early on in the video process? Things that, you know, you have penciled that out. I'll never do again. <laughs> well, I, I'm a, I'm an experimenter. I, I'm the best uh, co-angler that you can have as a team because I, you can be in the front of the boat fishing what's working and I will be tying and retying and I love to experiment. And I do that with YouTube every year, all the time. Gotcha. And yeah, this works. No, this doesn't work. That kind of stuff. And, and a lot of times it has to do with what works for me. You know, the mistakes that I've made is I tried the vlogging thing. And kind of that, tough. that ain't for me. I, I can do it, but it's not what I enjoy doing, you know, mm -hmm. and then that more that, that had to do a lot, you know, a lot, uh, had to do a lot with the decision not to do it and just to stick to, to teaching. I'll never grow as fast as the vloggers ever because I'm not a I'm not an entertainer. You know, I don't, You're a teacher. I, I don't throw out fake, crazy videos. I just do my thing. I teach. And so I, I the only people that are going to want to watch my videos are the, the ones that want to learn. Gotcha. And That's so it. I, and, and my mistakes, I just kind of forget about them. It's one of those things where I'll try little oddball, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll try different things like, um, when do you launch a video? What are the topics? What are this and that? I mean, and, and how much production do I need to put into it? You know, mm -hmm. do the lower production ones work or do the higher production ones work? And I'm still trying to tweak those out a little bit, you know? Um, and I really think the middle of the road, if they're overproduced and they look too professional, I think that it, it kind of turns those off that want to learn. You okay. know, that's interesting. Yeah. I mean, and, and I don't mind throwing a little music in the, the intro and throwing a little music in the, in the pre intro clip or that kind of stuff. But after that, it's let's sit down and let's teach you and let's try to get as much information. I do want to get into more of the, the, uh, the visual aids and things like that. The, the, the overlays and things like that into my videos, but that's still, I've got to have time to sit down and learn how to do that. I say, yeah, <laughs> yeah. We're learning that. How do you choose a topic for your video? So like for this upcoming season, is it just, okay, I've got the opportunity to fish these lakes and this will work at that lake or just how do you do, how do you decide? Um, everything really. It's, it has a lot to do with, uh, uh, questions that I get on, on my videos. So like one video will generate three more videos or five more videos, depending on the questions that I mm -hmm. get. Um, it's, uh, a lot of it is seasonal. You know, when you're talking about trending stuff, you got to stay with the seasons. You can't just kind of throw something out there just because, you know, whatever, just to get it out there. Um, it's, um, it's usually, all, and then when I'm out on the lake, if I, like I had a, a, a the video I, I shot on Rocky Mountain the day before you guys had that tournament. Where yeah. I, where we, I was smashing I, them. I wish I'd have seen that uh, <laughs> the day before we fished that tournament as well. Yeah, I was I was on uh, on East Antioch, uh -huh. and there wasn't a boat on East Antioch. It was just me that day. And I, and I didn't know you guys were having that tournament, by the way. But uh, I was I was out there just testing stuff for 13, and that's all I was doing. And I, was, and I ran over this flat, and I was like, man, there's bass down there. And I had a spoon tied on from fishing Altoona the day before. Okay. And I just backed up and threw that spoon out, and the first three casts caught three pounders, I mean, three, three, three pounders. And I was just smashing them on that point. And so that I, I turned the cameras on. I'm like, oh, crap, I got to set the cameras up. Right. So I turned cameras on and did a real quick spoon video. Those those happen. They don't happen very often. Spur of the moment. Yeah. Yeah. And so. Yeah. We, we caught wind of that video just a little too late. Yes, you did. And uh, <laughs> all that lake frustrates me. Uh, it's. I, I hope everybody stays focused on the trophy lake. Right. Because I don't ever fish it. Well, I've never, I've, yeah, <laughs> I've never been on the trophy lake. We have seen some good fish caught out of that lake, though. But. Yeah. I think, how many big ones did we catch this year? I, I, I had a kayak tournament that was the, the June or July, I think, um, 
uh what was it it was the kayak bass fishing kbf state challenges where right. you have a full full month to catch your biggest five fish and i had to throw nine inch bull shads to upgrade towards the middle of the, of the month because i had all five or seven and eight pounders in my stringer and so i was throwing I literally every day i was chunking a nine inch bull shad and and catching fish you know it's just one of those things where and it's all in a, it's an offshore lake so if you're not an offshore fisherman you're not even going to pay, you're not even going to see the big ones. So, We're learning that. Yeah, that, I think there's three weeks out of the year where the big bass move shallow. So I got you. Okay. So <laughs> write that down, Josh. All right. So let's keep that. Now, in your videos, are you species specific? Do you, most of them are bass. Do you do any on any other species? I know bass the best. Okay. I fish for cra- crappy. I fish I'm glad with, you said that right. <laughs> I fish for crappy uh, December, January because that's when they taste the best. Okay, and you get in that cold weather and their 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 flesh firms up in the in the summer. I don't eat them. They got parasites and they got you know soft flesh and everything else. That so, is a good tip that I've never heard anybody say. Yeah, November, December, or December, January. I'm I, I'll fill the freezer with cra- with crappy and, and go back to bass fishing. That is interesting. That's and, a good tip. And so, uh, yeah, mostly bass. Um, I, w- I would love to branch off, but I'm just not good at anything else. I got gotcha. you. Know? Maybe trout, but that's, you know, that doesn't get the, near the attention as bass. And then redfish down in, in Louisiana. If I lived anywhere closer to Louisiana marsh, uh-huh. you'd never see me catching that largemouth. Redfish. I love redfish. Gosh, in a kayak, I love redfish. That's awesome. So I, I, I didn't think about that redfish. Uh, I've caught one in my life, and I think oh, really? I caught it. I was fishing for trout at St. George, and I think I caught it by accident mm. over by the thing. So it seems like everywhere we go these days, we see a young angler. Well, not, not always a young angler, but they've got the GoPros on their boats. Mm-hmm. And they're trying to video their catches, and they're trying to get a channel started, whether it's to promote themselves as a fisherman or, or to teach. Any advice that you could give these guys as far as, you know, what to do with their camera setups or what you think people are out there looking for? I think I was the first one to ever use GoPros on on fishing YouTube videos. Right. And the reason I chose, and it was a Hero 2. That's okay. how long ago it was. And the reason I chose a GoPro is because of the wide angle. And you could get a really good frame of you standing in the front of the boat at a little more than arm's length away. And so you could put the camera up in on the nose of the boat in front of you, in front of the fish finder, in front of the, and right next to the trolling motor and get a really good frame. So you could still fish at the right angles and, and teach and talk to the camera. And that was the reason I chose a GoPro. And okay. um, it wasn't my first camera. I, I lost a couple of really nice cameras off tripods out of the back of the boat. But uh, the... To, the biggest advice I always tell guys is that that I get guys coming, man, I'm about to start a YouTube channel, so on and so forth. What do I need to do? I look at them and say, why haven't you started yet? You, you're talking about it. Go do it. Go do it. And that's what I tell them. I said, I'm, I'm the one that didn't quit. The only difference between me and any other YouTuber is I'm the one that didn't quit. I always tried to get better. I always tried to improve my knowledge of what I was doing, and I just never let anything caused me to quit just being stubborn yep i've been attacked i've been you know i've i've i've, I've been called fat almost every day i get a comment that says i'm a fat guy on it <laughs> they're coming you know? with they're coming with this i know oh, they're coming yeah. with me, yeah. and i'm proud of it man i eat good absolutely I cook good i love to barbecue and stuff i don't care about being fat it it <laughs> if you I, make me feel better right now <laughs> <laughs> but but it's one of those things where i just don't quit i don't have it in me uh i may slow down to make time for my i realize that i'm spending too much time and I'm not making time for my family, I'll slow right. down like I'm right now. I'm slowing down. Gotcha. You know, me and my son are on the way over to Buck Shoals to go do a quota hunt. He's going to shoot a deer. We're going to go home, and I'd spend time with my family. Making memories. Yeah, exactly. And so that's what my dad did for me, and, and YouTube's going to have to go to the side when it comes time to do work with my family. So that Well, that's that's a really good thing to do, and that, that's some good advice as well. Mm-hmm. That sometimes we get a little busy. Yep. You need to prioritize a little little better. Yeah, but with camera setups and that kind of thing, I always try to have two angles. Okay. Um, I always try to have one that's on all the time. The reason I love GoPros is you can put them in looping. And so you set them in a five or a 20-minute loop, and you just turn them on, hook them up to a power source. An exter- I always try to use an external power source just because I can get. I don't have to worry about the battery. And, and literally you catch a fish, you get done with all that stuff, reach back, stop the recording, start it again. And you just save the last five minutes or 20 minutes 
right and you saved your sd card and everything else the the hard part is is that don't worry about waterproofing so okay. i've been doing this for 12 years right i've lost two gopros one of them was on a head mount and i don't use head mounts anymore and the other one was i was changing the battery out and had taken it it was the hero 2 and it, it you had to take it out of the case to change the battery and I took and I opened up the thing and it went plop, hit my hit my console and bounced right into the water. And I spent two hours looking for it get, to get the SD card out of it. And yeah. so you're gonna you're gonna lose them. You're just not gonna lose them as often as you think you would. So don't worry about the waterproofing. Worry about your audio. Okay. And and your video quality. And okay. So, so what are you using currently? Uh, Hero Five in the back behind me. Mm-hmm. And then I actually have a Sony. It's my new, it's the main production camera. It's a little white action cam. It's a Sony XR something. I don't know why Sony uses so many numbers on their stinking names. <laughs> but uh, anyway, it's a, it, you just search up on Amazon Sony action cam, and that's what I use. Okay. Just get, you don't, there's no color correction or anything. You don't do any of that with it because it has great color, and it's just a really good camera. And it also has a mic jack in the back. So I don't have to use a stupid GoPro dongle that it is 50 bucks and lasts for two, two months, and you have to go replace it. So you just, you just so gotta, you have a you have a wireless mic yep, to I the use, Sony. Yep, the new uh, Rode uh, wireless Go mics that are like two hundred bucks. Right, and they're one inch by one inch. It seems like or inch and a half by inch and a half. They're great. Okay, great quality. Um, for what I do, for what you, I got yeah. you. What about your editing when you get home? Tell um, us a little bit about that process. I've got an editor. Okay, that lives in Grayson, Georgia. Okay, uh, named Paul. And he does it. He does that for a living for the company he works for. He does their YouTube and their videos. And it's actually a um, a lawn care chemical company that has a YouTube channel that he does. He does all their videos. But um, I pay him to do what I can't do. Um, and then there are I still I still edit quite a bit when I just want one to get out really quick. I'll go shoot it and I'll come back. I'll do the editing and send and and put it on there. But he saves me a lot of time. Uh, back before that, I was doing. It was I was working eighty to one hundred twenty hours a week. Between Nobody sees behind filming, the scenes. Yeah, between filming and doing editing, you didn't. Yeah. Right. So, and I'd love. I and I and I'm starting to edit a little bit more just to keep my head in it. Gotcha. And it helps me to to be a little bit more detailed on how I shoot if I'm editing it myself. Are you as deficient in the technology as I am? No. <laughs> so you're better, or you're or you're as good, or, or? I. I try to keep up with everything for, I'm really good at teaching myself and I'm gotcha. not, I'm not one of those guys. So I, I've had a couple of buddies that are YouTubers and one of them's a really good successful YouTuber now, but at the beginning he was like, man, I hate learning this stuff. And he wouldn't learn the, the, the technical details of how YouTube worked and how the computer worked and how editing worked. His wife did it all because mm-hmm. she was good at it. And I, I don't know how many times I pounded that guy, and now finally he's figured it out to a point. But now he has an editor that's doing his stuff, so right. I have to worry about I got that. You. So you got to know your strengths and your weaknesses. For me, is I'm too determined not to learn. Gotcha. What's going on? And so even if I'm horrible at it, you know, I, I think I was the first person ever to get Google, uh, um, uh, what get uh, Gmail. I got Gmail when it was at a, a two days old. You know, okay. I signed up for Chrome when it was a day and a half old. So and you're ready to try new things as, I, as soon as they come out. I'm, you know, I, I, I when Facebook allow, uh, uh, came out and allowed you to use your first your URL, right? Two minutes after they allowed it, I was on there getting my own URL. You know, so also being proactive. Yeah, just keeping track of what's going on and that kind of stuff, and just and just keeping keeping track of what's coming down the road. I think the reason YouTube worked out so well for me is because I saw it coming. Okay, I didn't see I didn't see other people doing it and copying it. I said, the world is moving to video. What can I do to, you know, I, this was after I'd already started making YouTube videos, but I realized when the day I realized that the world was coming to video, I realized that I didn't need to quit because it was coming. And I didn't know when, and I just told my wife to be patient with me. Mm-hmm. You know, one of those arguments that we had was like, um, she said, you know, she said, we're not making any money. He said, we're still in, we're still in the red with this fishing thing. You need to sell your boat mm. to make ends meet, mm-hmm. and I told her, I said, "All right, I'll put my my boat up on 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 the online for for sale." 
she doesn't know I put it up for about 6,000 more than it was worth. Right. So you knew. Uh-huh. And I yeah. said that if, and I told myself, if anybody wants to spend that much money on my boat, they can have it and I'll just go buy another one. Right. But I knew I wasn't going to get rid of my boat. And so, and, uh, and it wasn't, it was 10 years before I told her that I've been married almost 20 years. <laughs> And, uh, and so how'd that conversation go? It was, uh, she, she Come was, on, little, let, uh, yeah. I, well, it was after I was, I was making money. So she was like, she's like, I'm glad you didn't sell your boat. I said, yeah, I know. I said, cause I, I had a feeling and I, and that argument was like, honey, look, I haven't asked for any of this stuff. This kind of stuff just kind of has happened to me. Right. And I've followed what felt good from day one. If a, even in sponsors, if it doesn't feel good, I don't do it. I got you. You know, and I've gotten worse and worse at that as as it's become a full time job. And right. I, and every year I have to reevaluate my sponsorships and reevaluate: Do I really believe in this product, or do I really believe in this company, and do I really want to keep selling them? And I have to reevaluate every year. I understand, and that's a good thing to do. You 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 were kind of segueing into my next question: the future of YouTube, the future of videos itself. Where do you see it, given the experience that you have in it? Where do you see it going? It's hard to say because now politicians are getting involved with it. Mm-hmm. And I don't like politics and I hate politicians. Mm-hmm. Um, don't trust them. I don't care what side of the, of the aisle they're on. And now that the FTC has gotten involved with YouTube and worried about what kids are watching and stuff like that, I'm afraid they don't. But politicians are really good at making decisions without being informed. Right. And so the I'm not worried too much about it because I don't uh, – my videos don't only live on YouTube. They also live on a, on a, um, a hard drive in my, in my computer, or I have a, um, an external hard drive that I store all my videos on. Right. So if YouTube goes away, I've got some, I can always do something else with the videos, but, um, I really see, uh, YouTube continuing to be a viable, uh, way to teach people for at least another 10 years. Okay. At least another. I mean, and and probably further into that. But uh, I don't see anything else coming behind it. Is a thing, you know. And no I, alternative or nothing to it. Right not now. really. Not not as a. And I mean, I can go off and do um, side side gigs, like do my own in, instructional series, and and where you go and you pay to get a you know a, a videos and and personal time with me and that kind of stuff kind of like what the uh, chefs the professional chefs are doing right now right and i'm thinking about doing that i'm actually already halfway through making that decision but it, it's there's other avenues but i think youtube will always be there at least as long as i'm still above the ground okay that leads me into uh, a question about guiding mhm have you ever done that before i did it when i first started with youtube um Mainly just to keep my wife happy, to mm-hmm. get a little extra money. Just income. In so it was income based then. Yeah. Reason. Okay. Yeah. And I and I did and I loved it. It was my stress relief. I loved to guide. But what I would do differently is I would go to those people's lakes, and mm. I would teach them how to find fish for the next three months on their lake. And so I was traveling a lot. I was going to Gunnersville. I was going to Kentucky Lake, and I lived in Augusta at the time. And I that's was a going, long drive. I was going all over the all over the southeast and camping and fishing and taking guy fishing and just, you know, and and I loved it because the guy the, I'd see these guys on social media catching fish for the next three months. I mean, just wherever they were going, they knew how to find them, and that was where what I really enjoyed doing. And I may go back to it one day. I don't have time right now. Right. You know, I've got some of my old clients getting, trying to get a hold of me. And they're like, Hey, can you take, I'm like, I can't, I don't have time. It's just too busy right this second. Yep. I don't have a captain's license. So they kind of frown on that on Gunnersville and along the Tennessee river. Oh, okay. I got you. And so maybe that'll be something I do when I decide to retire from making instructional videos, but I don't think I'll ever retire. Do you ever have time to personal fish? Just no cameras. Just I'm going to fish to have fun. Yeah. I try to do that at least once or twice a week. Oh, okay. Yeah, where I just shut the cameras off and go fishing. But then when I start catching them, I'm like, crap, I got to turn the cameras on. <laughs> so, so, that's how, so that's what happened out at, at Rocky yeah, that day. Exactly. Yeah, because I was just, I was going to be out there for about an hour and a half. Um, you know, 13's getting into the bait world. 13 fishing is. Okay. They're, they The cool thing about 13 is that they're not copying anybody. They're trying to do everything a little different than everybody else. Their baits look different. Their frog design is different. Their, you know, every they, their number one rule is don't copy people. Okay. And so I, I get all these great new baits that are that are three D printed, um, and they're ugly as all get out. But I, I'm just supposed to go test them and see how they work. See, 
you know, not even try to catch fish on them. I just want to see what the action is and, and, uh, if it's a saw plastic, see what the action is with that and how it's supposed to work. So I test them and I give them my, my honest opinion on whether what's working and what's not. Right. And so, um, so yeah, it's a, to, that's all I was only out there for, I was only gonna be out there for maybe an hour and a half. And I saw that school and I was out there until I got too cold. Cause I didn't bring any hoodie or anything else. It just, well, if you keep busy <laughs> enough, you keep yourself warm. Yep. Um, when you personal fish, or I guess, you know, it doesn't really matter what, what method do you prefer uh, larger lakes on a, on a bass boat, smaller, you know, mid-sized reservoirs like Rocky. You have a preference? I love small lakes. You know, Georgia is blessed with so many of these electric only lakes. Absolutely. And so many, and I almost wrote a book about that back in the day, but right before gas prices got really, really high, mm -hmm. I was going to travel around and do a book about all, you know, the, there's a trout book out. that's all the trout waters of North Georgia. I was going to do all the small lakes of North Georgia. Gotcha. And I had the outline and everything else, and then gas prices shot through the roof, and I wasn't on YouTube yet, and I was trying to, you know, there's no way I was going to be able to do it. Right. I was going to be able to afford it. So, but anyway, so it's got so many good small lakes. Public fishing areas are decent. The big lakes are not good for largemouth bass fishing. Right. Uh, Georgia is probably out of Georgia, Alabama, and Florida, and, and Tennessee, Georgia's the worst at caring about their largemouth bass in their big lakes. Because those spots are there. The spots, yeah, but they don't stock them. Right. The only thing that they stock, from, as far as I know, in big lakes is striped bass and hybrids. Mm. And so, um, and that's the state doing that. Now, you go to Tennessee, they stock Florida strain bass in almost all their lakes. They stock, or F1s, usually Florida right. strain. They, um, Alabama, the same way. They understand that, that, it, that if you have a good bass fishery, the amount of money that comes in from people traveling there and having destinations and stuff like that. It's so, interesting you brought that up because I was at a doctor's visit a few months ago and, and Bassmaster had the, I believe it was a July, August edition, and they were listing the top 100 lakes in the, in the Southeast or whatever it was. It, it might have been in the United States. And just because I guess I live near Lanier, mm -hmm. it's I the only assumed, one on there. Yeah. Well, actually, it wasn't even the top one in Georgia. Wow. But it wasn't nowhere near the top in the Southeast. Right. It was Alabama and Tennessee lakes and all that. Uh, I believe Clark's Hill was actually ranked by Bassmaster over Lanier. Yep. Now they did say Lanier had a you know world class spotted bass fishery, but it was not yep. near to the level, and that kind of surprised me. And I guess that goes with what you're saying, you know, the largemouth bass in the other states taking yeah taking an precedent. initiative into well, that. Well, and you look at it this way, you you it's very difficult to make a living guiding for largemouth bass in the state of Georgia. I don't know that many people that do it. Right, you go to Alabama. Go to Tennessee. Every lake's got dozens, really, that are making a living guiding for largemouth bass, but they can't do it in Georgia. And the reason is, is because the 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 large lake fisheries are not good. You know, I remember when Varner was at its prime, where they were catching double digits every day, just about it seemed like, and there were guys coming from all over the country to fish Lake Varner. Mm -hmm. But we can't get people to come from all over the country to fish Oconee. Or fish, you can get them to fish Lanier because of the spotted bass and the striped bass. Right. But, you know, uh, West Point, that kind of stuff, that people just don't come to shoot, to, to fish there. That's interesting. So, so you like the smaller lakes just because of the variety or uh, because of the, the large mouth? Yeah, population? large mouth populations usually pretty better, pretty good. You know, you got the new um, um, Hard Labor Creek Reservoir. Absolutely. We were on there last year. That's, that's a oh, monster man. for a small lake. Yeah, I fished a kayak tournament up and uh down there about a month and a half two months ago i won it but um i love where that lake's going to be going because there's so much more room for that lake to grow it's 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 all, probably only holding about 20 percent of the bass that it can hold really you think yeah and and bait fish and everything else have a long ways to grow but talking to the dnr around that area and that kind of stuff they care and they're going to take care of that lake as long as they possibly can and it's going to it's an amazing it's lake. It's going to have some giants. Anytime you get on a small water reservoir that's got a bridge that goes across it or <laughs> roads that just dump into the water, I'm like, this is cool. This yeah. is this is awesome. Yeah. So um, you mentioned kayak fishing. Mm -hmm. Passion of yours? I, I've always paddled. Um, I, I, I started out at Boy Scout camp in a canoe paddling around, and, and, and that's where I remember catching my first largemouth, that kind of stuff, throwing a little uh, rooster tail around the, around the shore, shoreline cover. Um, but when I realized that they make kayaks that you can fish out of, 
I went and bought one. Mm-hmm. And I realized that that was a mistake just going and buying one because I got in it for two days, realized my back hurt after those right, <laughs> after fishing right. out of one. I sold it to my brother-in-law and, and turned around and waited until I saved mon- enough money for one that was comfortable. And But I about 50% of my videos are kayaks now. Right. You know, I try to split that up evenly because I've got good kayak sponsors and I've got good boat sponsors. Um, and so, but I love it because, you know, people always ask, what's better? So, well, if that I, was a question that was coming, if I need to, if I need to cover water and find fish, a big boat is a lot better, mm-hmm. but there's something about catching a large mouth bass out of a kayak. That is amazing. You know, and I'll give you a, for instance, I, I took John Cox, the FLW champion, John Cox, about three or four years ago, I took him fishing down in Florida and I brought some kayaks along with me and threw him in one of them and said, come on, let's go. And so we jumped in, we went down and around and i showed him a spot on the it was down at um uh bienville plantation where i used to uh, i used to uh, promote a little bit of their kayak stuff but anyway took him to a spot where i knew there would be some big fish and he sat there and he caught one about eight and a half pounds and it fought and it splashed next to the boat and splashed water on him and and he's a shallow water florida fisherman i mean he doesn't he doesn't even know how to read a fish finder right he fishes that shallow and so he looked at me when he got that fish and he said this is a fish i will never forget because there's just something different about catching a fish right there the experience you know, it's just awesome and uh, and anybody who 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 hasn't tried it just try it that's all i say you don't have to get addicted to it like a lot of us do just try catching a bass out of a kayak it's a lot of fun and there are kayaks out out there that'll hold big people so <laughs> and 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 the the biggest um misinformation out there is that you'll flip in a kayak yeah, you'll flip in one if it's a whitewater kayak and you're trying to fish out of it. Right. But these fishing kayaks these days, you can stand up, you can do, you can dance on top of one, and it's not going to very flip stable. Over. You will fall out before it will flip. Okay. And so, and I've proven that once or twice. Right. And so, um, they're super stable. Mine, my bona fide SS one twenty seven is I'm two hundred and forty pounds, and it's like standing on a dock. You know, if you stand up, you can stand up easy and fish out of it standing up and set the hook and. You know, there's some nuances and differences that we can talk about for all day long, the difference in hook sets and stuff because your boat's pulling towards the fish when you set the hook. But it's a, it's a stable platform. So there's no reason for somebody not to go try it. I got you. So what about the – do you have your, I assume, sonar? Uh-huh. Is it specifically designed for the kayak or just- – Nope. You can use anything? Yeah, you can uh, – the way things are set up now, like my, my Bonafide now has a pod. Okay. And it's called a it's called a, a dry pod and it and you can put it's got a spot in there for your battery and enough room for all your cables and you can mount your transducer on the bottom and there's a hole in the boat you drop that pod down into and your tra- fish finder is mounted on top of it. So literally I can take my fish finder out, put it in the back of my truck and then put it back in my kayak when I'm fishing it or I can swap it between kayaks cuz I have a couple of different bona fides. Okay. And it'll drop down in the little hole and lock down and and that's it's all self-contained. Very convenient. Very, uh, very convenient, and and it's just the ones that you can mount the cut the the transducer outside the hole are just phenomenal. And I have side scan, I have down imaging, I have all that stuff. Everything you got on your big boat. Yep. How about a kayak tournament? I know that's a very popular thing. How mm-hmm. does one of those work? Um, it's catch, photo, release okay. is the biggest thing. We don't keep five. We we take pictures of our biggest five. Um, most people use, uh, or most big tournaments use an app called, uh, tourney X. Okay. And so it's an outside company that's doing all the judging and stuff like that of all the fish. So you have a measuring board and it has to be approved. So there's like three different brands that get it, that are approved because they're, per- they're perfect. And they you know, it's very difficult right. to, to, to manipulate, uh, manipulate yeah. them. So the big, I'll, I'll run through it real quick. Begin before the tournament starts, usually the midnight before, or when you get to the, the meeting prior to the tournament, the tournament director hands out an identifier or gives you a number to write on your hand or whatever else. So that's a number specific, specific for that day. So you can't catch a fish the day before and enter it into the, into the tournament because you don't know what that identifier is. Right. That identifier has to be in the picture that you take with the fish. The fish has to be laying on the measuring board a specific way, pointing to the left, mouth closed, can't pinch the tail, and then you take pictures with your cell phone. And my son has my cell phone, but if you know if anybody ever see my cell phone, it's got a tether on there that I slip, slip my wrist through and I and okay. I take pictures. So if I drop it, it just drops down and it don't Smart. fall in the water. 
Um, but anyway, so you take pictures of the phone and then you submit it onto Tourney X and then they have judges that judge it. And then they'll send you an email or a text message letting you know if it was bad, if you, if you did something wrong. And so what we typically do is we will catch the fish, put it on the board, take a bunch of pictures, put the fish on a fish grip that's tethered to the boat, lay the fish down in the water, and then check the pictures to make sure they're good before we send them. Gotcha. And then we're, then we're good. Right. And if, and if for some reason we miss something, then we know that that fish was disqualified, so we have to go back and try to catch another one. Right. And so they don't just leave you hanging, which is really nice. Um, but it's still your best five. Still your best five. That's and the goal is, well, for me, the goal is always 100 inches. Okay. If you can catch five fish that are that total 100 inches, you're going to win. You're going to win the money or something. Like that. 90 inches is probably a good, a good, you know, a, I always try to get over 90 inches, but my goal is always 100 inches. So you can, you concentrate more on length? On I mean, length. It, it, yep. And what's nice about that is you don't have to worry about, oh man, it's pre-spawn or it's post-spawn. So all my fish are going to be three pounds less or two pounds less. Or right. Whatever. It don't matter. You know, if they're, if they're post-spawn fish, they're still going to be the same length they were when they were pre-spawn fish. Exactly. And so, um, and, and the thing is, is what you're doing is you're catching the older fish, the longer the fish, the older it is. Mm -hmm. Um, and so you are on that body of water, you're going for the older fish. You're not just going for the big fat footballs. Right. You know, I, I've caught a craziest fish I ever caught in my life was 21 inches around and 19 inches long, weighed eight and a half pounds. Seriously. Yeah. Just short, fat, short, football. fat, round. Yep, eight and a half pound, nineteen incher. Mm. But you know what that would have done on a kayak tournament? It had only been a nineteen inch 19 fish. Nineteen inch fish. I got you. <laughs> so do they? Do, so because I'm not as familiar with the kayak tournament. Mm -hmm. Do you, you ever have a? Or I've seen anything like the MLF now, where it's a cumulative weight for the entire day. Or is it always pretty much just five? There are some clubs that do that. Some local clubs that do that. Right. But nationally, like with KBF. Mm -hmm. Um, it's no, it's just the best five. Do you fish a trail? Uh, not yet. Not yet. But you think about it. Uh, BASS just announced that that's, that's they where I was going to go trail. with it. So did that pique your interest? I'm putting my feelers out. I'm trying to get the, the money together from sponsors to do it. So we'll see. That we'll will see be, I'm be. at least going to fish three of them. So. Okay. Well, let's talk about you fishing personally mm -hmm. yourself. How would you describe yourself as a fisherman? You power, you finesse. What do you like to do? <laughs> I do what the fish want me to do. Is that it? Um, I when when and I how used do to, you determine that? Well, when I used to fish the Barry night tournaments mm -hmm. uh, on Jackson, I used to drive all the way from Augusta and fish them with my best friend in, in Covington. And uh, I was a finesse fisherman. I was the first one I knew of to drop shot. I was, you know, right. shaky heading was my my life. I could always catch your five fish, and he would be one to catch the kicker. Gotcha. And so. Um, but through making videos, kind of my excuse for being getting serious about videos was I was going to become a better fisherman at everything because I had to teach everything. Mm -hmm. And so I became uh, pretty serious about learning how to do, be a power fisherman. But I'll finesse fish a crankbait in a heartbeat. You know, I'll take a crankbait and I'll crawl it as slow as I can crawl it on the bottom. And I'll, you know, just it's, it's more or less I've gotten to the point where, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty... I'm good at a lot of things. Mm -hmm. I don't have anything. I'm uh, I'm not the best at one specific thing. Right. Um, but I'm I'm better at figuring out what the fish want than most people, and what, how they want it. What is the one thing that you hate doing more than anything on the water? Throw an Alabama rig. An Alabama rig. Yeah, I I cannot stand to throw an A rig. And why is that? It has too many hooks. You catch one fish, it gets balled up in your hooks. You hook them in the gut. You hook them in the back. Okay. You hook them in the tail. You, it just has too many other hooks that that penetrate the fish that don't need to be penetrating the fish. So it's more of a personal reason, not yeah. that you can't has, throw it. You yeah. just don't like it. I just don't like to throw it. Now, do you think that should be illegal in all tournaments, stuff like that? No, I, I, I don't. I just think that, that I think there's better alternatives out there. Okay. Um, so I, you, got, you got a guy that likes to throw the A-rig, mm -hmm. and you want to kind of steer him away from it. What would be an alternative you would try to, you know, suggest to him? Be a man and throw a fluke. Um, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, I don't. It, it, I don't know. I don't know. It's just one of those things where when I'm I, and sometimes I throw it just to see what it'll do, but it's when I bring in these three and five pounders that have hooks stuck in their gut. Mm -hmm. I'm just like this ain't this just not necessary. Not necessary. Do you have a home lake? I guess Rocky Mountain now, right? Rocky Mountain PFA. I know it really, really good. You know, so. 
Yeah, there are some secrets on that lake uh, that only about three of us know, and we're all kayak fishermen, so we don't share them. Would, would Clint be the other one? <laughs> yeah, Clint's the other one. Um, I, uh, I, goober. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to Clint. He's supposed to come down, and, and he's going to be at the Geminar that we're going to be at okay. uh, in January, so I look forward to meeting him. I've had a few conversations with him. Who's the other guy out there? Uh, it had to be Jim Ware. Jim Ware. The River Goat. The River Goat. Yeah, that's what his nickname is. He's got a blog called The, the River Goat. Okay, all right. And so we all call him The River Goat. But uh, yeah, uh, Clint and Jim are the, the salt of the earth. I mean, I did not realize when I, was mo- when I moved to Rome that I was moving to the epicenter of kayak fishing in Georgia. It seems that way, yes. It's, you know, you, you got some, we got some great anglers and some great rivers and great bodies of water that you, that are great for kayak fishing. And so when I realized that, I was just like, man, this is just going to be too much fun. Now, Clint lives gosh one block from rocky mountain oh okay All and right. now now he just got a job working at the power plant next that next r- to rocky, rocky mountain, mountain. <laughs> so he didn't have to go anywhere so he's set yeah he's the one that beat me in that tournament on in in uh that i was catching all those big fish and oh, okay. he he did it all on the last two days he just went he, he hadn't fished mostly at the most of the month and he went in the last two days and started. Just hit that spot. Yeah, hit my spot. No, <laughs> same, hit your spot. Okay. Same. I know he's where he's catching them because we all catch the big fish on the same four, five, six spots. But I got you. How about Brushy Branch? Do you ever get over there? Any? I don't. Okay. Um, you don't I, ever get in the or the rivers up there? I do. Uh, when I'm fishing with uh, Jim Ware, I'll fish the rivers and that kind of with kayaks. But I went to Brushy Branch once with my boat when it was brand new. Yeah. You know, and when I lose the lower unit, I, I, I'm out for a while and it just it, it scares the crap out of me because it's my full-time job you know yeah, just, you have to stay in that little channel right there <coughs> yep and i hit a stump oh, on, okay. and i hit it pretty hard and i'm like man this is just not i can go catch fish somewhere else gotcha you know? but i, I asked that because we fished an electric only tournament up there uh-huh. and i'd never been there before and i didn't pre-fish and it's dark and everybody takes off and i'm thinking that okay well that looks like a little point and i find out i'm throwing in two foot of water yep <laughs> <laughs> and i didn't know anything about it and it was just so frustrating yeah i you know i used to be all into that electric the electric boats i, I right? used to build them oh okay i'd go i back when again when gas prices were low i would drive from augusta to my dad's shop in covington and i had I'd have a, a empty hole of a 1980s tracker and I'd gut it out and build it and make about six grand selling it. You know, it's just one of those fun little things I did. So I got you. Well, did you fish any of the electric only tournaments uh-huh. back in yep. the day? Yeah, my first tournament I ever won was on uh, Varner in electric tournament. On Varner? Yep. What do you think about Varner now? They ruined it. I knew that. I told them they were going to do it when they did it. So And how they ruined it? Well, what what happened was somebody introduced hydrilla to the lake. Right. And at the first year, year and a half, that hydrilla was only in that one pocket where the boat ramp was. And we were telling them again and again, just drain the lake, kill, kill the hydrilla in the pocket. Well, they didn't do anything for three years. And so at the end of the three years, it was all the way around the lake, maybe even four. But the hydrilla was all the way around the lake. And uh, from what I understand, the lake manager talked to somebody down in Florida. The guy down in Florida said, the, yes, hydrilla will grow 26 feet deep, but that's in super clear water. Right. But all he heard was 26 feet deep, and that's about where their intake is for their water. And so they panicked and threw a bunch of carp in there, and the carp ate all the grass. So what the, the grass at that time was milfoil and hydrilla. And right. before that, it was just milfoil and maybe a couple other types of grass. But that grass allowed the gizzard shad to grow, and they gave them a good estuary to grow up and be good-sized gizzard shad, and the gizzard shad is what made the bass so big. Right. Not only that, they also had a cross-strain of Florida bass in there. Mm-hmm. And so um, that's why you could win an online length tournament in a heartbeat out there because the fish were really long and really healthy. And then the grass went away, and the, the hybrids ate all the, all the gizzard shad, and now there's hardly – there's a few gizzard shad, but there's not very many not enough to sustain the big bass population we had so yeah because i used to remember seeing pictures like on gon forum mm-hmm. back in the day guys would post pictures of just some monsters, you know and then they colored out where they were at you know so you I, saw I've the picture they got yep. the fish but... i've seen a 16 pound bass come out of there wow how big is the lake i think it's 1100 acres 1100 acres a yeah, little bit smaller or about hard labor size or yeah no a hard labor is considerably uh, probably about 400 acres more oh, okay so, all right it well it, hard labor fish is bigger because it's deeper and it's got longer arms. Oh, it fish is huge. Yeah, it fish is really. You better have a good battery. I have two batteries for my <laughs> boat. I have electric motor on the back of my kayak. So. Oh, okay, I got you. Um, but yeah, you gotta have good batteries. You gotta be able to get to take care of that. But yeah, the, the Varner they just messed it up with the carp. I am not a believer in carp. 
uh, and, and I, and I've worked close with Bob Lusk, who's the owner and editor of Pond Boss magazines, also the number one private, uh, warm water fisheries biologist in the world. Okay. And so, and we've talked about that. He says, grass is where the babies grow up and whether it's a baby bait fish or baby bass, that's where the babies grow up. Right. And if you don't have enough cover to sustain those smaller fish so they can get bigger and become a bigger meal for the bigger bass, then your bigger bass won't get bigger. That makes sense. You know, and so you've got to have an estuary for them to grow up and to get into and to get bigger than a little piece of popcorn. Right. And so once they got rid of the grass, that went away. I got you. Yeah. Let me let me ask you just your thought that was brought up about you fished Latham a long time ago. Mm-hmm. And since then they've added bait fish to it. When it first opened they did. And right. I, and I asked that because it's our home lake. In the wintertime we notice that the bass are really long, really skinny. Mm-hmm. Now, somebody that was on here earlier, one of our earlier guests, Chris Gayton, on our second podcast, kind of theorized that because the bait's the bait is so small, the bass are spending more energy chasing the smaller bait, and thereby they can't put weight on. Right. What's your theory on something like that? Absolutely true. Another okay. thing is, is when the and when the and I don't know Varner, I, my, I had a personal best of 9.98 that I caught during that tournament I won on Barner. Right. Uh, and I caught it um, in September, early September. And the bat, that bass had just moved out of its summer haunts. And it hadn't fed much during the summer. It had stayed down deep and everything else. And it was pretty skinny. It would have been a 13, 14 pound bass. Wow. As skinny as it was. But so I caught the fish and I, I learned then that, um, that they put on a lot of weight during the wintertime. Mm-hmm. And you're right. In the late summer, early fall, the bait fish are really small, and they they do spend a lot of energy. But in the in the winter time, they sit on the bottom, and they just wait for the bait to come to them, and then they just open their mouth and eat it, and they don't move much. Right. And they grow, and they get bigger and bigger, and that's why you get the heavier fish in the springtime, not just the eggs, but healthy. Right. They're a lot healthier. Um. But it's just a that's the biggest thing is that you just need the bait and and Latham just never had the bait. And and you guys get pretty cold here in the winter time too. So the yeah, shad, yeah. you get a shad kill. Right. Um, Rocky mountain had one, uh, not this past spring, but the spring before last where I made forecast during a kayak tournament, pulled up four fresh dead shad off the bottom with a, with a spoon and I packed it up and went home mm. <laughs> or I went to the bank. I was like, I, I, there's no way you can compete with that. And, right. But uh, Latham, when it has a shad kill, if I remember correctly, it because I mean, I fished it back when it didn't have a lot of bait at all. Right. But if it doesn't have a lot of bait, that ain't a lot of fish to die, you know, to eat. Right. So. Well, it's, it, they put in, and it wasn't gizzard shad, thread fin. Thread fins. So it's got thread fin, and Chris theorized that if they would change that to gizzard, gizzard. it would help sustain gizzard, the weight. Gizzard are a lot hardier fish. They mm-hmm. can They can live better, and I think that's why Rocky Mountain is so good. Because mm. it has a very strong population of gizzard shad. We saw those on the sonar the day yep. we were there. It just looked like just tons wads, wads tons. of big fish. Yep. They look like wads of crappie, but you know they're not situ- they're not positioned right like right. crappie would be. So yeah, it's a gosh almighty. It, it, if yeah, if biologists the problem that I've learned with biologists is they are taught by the book. Right. And there's very few of them that are willing to step outside the book mm. and try something different. And especially the state ones, and I and I and I, I'm not pounding the state ones because that's just what the what it is. Right. Um, if they would just change from gizzard from uh, threadfin to gizzard on these smaller lakes, you'd see that. You'd see increases in sizes. You'd see uh, less of a drop off in weights and that kind of stuff. So gotcha. So we're entering into December. So as a transition going on, I would imagine um, on most lakes, if you were to give advice right now as to what you would target fish. Let's start on a big lake like Lanier or something, mm. some, or you know, pick a lake of your choice, maybe a big lake, and then we'll talk about a smaller reservoir. What tips and tactics would you use right now to target fish that you would, you know, you may change once you get on the water, depending yep. on what the fish give, but what would you think, this is what I'm going to go to first to start? What I like, my, my specialty is finding fish. And that's because I fished 15 years on Clark's Hill where you had to find them three or four times a day. Just because it's so huge. And blueback herring are nomadic, so they move all the time. So you always have to find fish. But I would start, on a big lake, I'd start in the mouth of a major creek Mm -hmm. um, all winter long. I'm going to start in the mouth of a major creek. 
and I'm going to play around with that first third of the creek and I'm going to play with the, around with the outside, you know, once you get to the mouth of the creek out on the main lake. And I'm going to look at points and I'm going to look at drops and I'm going to look at ditches. And wherever a creek channel or a river channel butts up against a point or up against the bank, that steeper uh, steeper bank, mm -hmm. that's where I'm going to be sitting throwing something, jerk bait, jig, or jerk bait or jig. Okay. You know, and so um, I like natural colored jigs on most of these lakes up here anyway. So it's going to be a brown jig or a brown jig. Right, I guess. And so. uh, it's going to have a smaller trailer on it, but it's going to be still. I love full time, full size jigs even in the winter time. So do you um, do anything like you know modifying your skirt or anything like that? The only difference is I use a hundred percent living rubber skirt in the winter time. Okay, and so it's got to be the movement. fat living rubber. It can't be the the skinny stuff. So Greenfish Tackle makes one that's perfect. It's just the, the living rubber is all it is. Okay. And um, and the reason is is because it, it flares out really slow. I mean, the skirts, when they cut the skirts, are like seven inches long. Right. And so it the longer the skirt, the slower it flares out. So you, it just flares out really slow, so you still get that slow action. You're not moving the bait. It's sitting there on the bottom. And then it opens up, and all you see is the target, which is the the chunk, the super chunk. Junior is what I usually use in the in the, in the winter time. So and it, and it just becomes a really good target. And you don't have to do anything. The current is what moves the skirt. Gotcha. And so um, a silicone skirt ha skirt has too much action in the winter time. It flares out too fast. So you want that, sm that you want slow, that slow flare. I and gotcha. So that's why I like a full size full size jigs. But once it opens up, it's not a full size jig anymore. Right. It's just the chunk as well. All that all they can see. Gotcha. So maybe a little rattle or something like that to get their attention, but usually you just kind of drag it on the bottom and have fun with it. And that's on a big, like, how about something like Rocky or Latham right now? Spoon. Uh, I'm still an offshore fisherman. And what I do is I, I follow the same thing. I'll find the pockets or the creeks that come in, and I'll follow them out and try to find the depth that the bat, that the bait fish are holding at. Mm -hmm. So I'm, if, I rely on my fish finder all the time anyway. But you try to find that depth that the bait fish are primarily holding at, and then I'm going to look for the ditches in that depth gotcha. or the creek channel in that depth, and I'm going to start there. And then I'm going to go up to a, maybe a point and that is a steeper point, but I'll start at that depth, and I'm going to try to find out. Because you don't have a thermocline to hold them anymore. You don't have anything. You just have, you know, they'll be up, up, down, wherever, depending on the temperature. Right. So, And if I'm a shallow water fisherman, I'm just going to hit rock and wood. All winter long, if I if I'm not like comfortable a jig offshore. or something like that, yeah, a jig or uh, maybe a um, a flat sided square bill fish really really slow. It was, crankbaits are excellent in the winter time. Okay, you just got to fish them slow, right? You know, I've I actually fished a lake in North Carolina years ago where half the lake was a quarter of inch of ice and the other half I could get my boat in, and so I got on the boat and I went out with a crankbait and I caught 25, 30 fish. Okay. But it felt like you were reeling in a wet sock because they weren't right. fighting and you had to really go slow and you had to get close to the bottom, but they'll come up and they'll just get, you know, wrap their mouth around it. Easy meal. And my theory is that bass in the wintertime, they'll, they'll eat your, they'll bite your bait. I just don't think that they're going to swallow very soon. So if you ever drag a worm in the wintertime and you don't feel the bite, but all of a sudden there's a fish on it, I think that fish just put it in his mouth and he's going to hold it there till he's ready to swallow it. Okay. You know what I'm saying? They do, right. If they fill their stomach up too much, they die because things rot because their metabolism is really slow. But there's nothing. They got a big enough mouth where they can catch a bait fish or catch a worm and hold it in there and keep it alive until they're ready to swallow it. It's kind of like my teenage breathe. son. He takes five or six bites and he's got them in his cheeks, you know. And <laughs> yeah. I'm like, come on, dude. Yep. You know? And that's my theory. And, I, and right. it's just that makes sense when you, you get all these light bites where they just kind of grab it and they're not trying to kill it or anything else. And so you think that might be why a lot of people, you know, they set the hook, they miss it. Yep. And they're like, I mean, it felt like a bite. Exactly. Yeah. I just think that the bass just kind of holds on to it and just doesn't bite. That's and interesting. Swallow. Going going back to the spoon, vertical jigging spoon, or do you cast and do the flutter spoon? Both. Which do you prefer, or does it matter? Again, what the fish want. The coldest days, I want. I'm I'm confident in a vertical jigging spoon because I can get over top of them and I can see them down in the ditches and on the bottom, and they're usually a lot deeper. Uh, the winter day, the, 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 the fall to winter transition days, mm -hmm. um, I'm going to use a, a flutter spoon and, uh, usually I want one that's big, that's wide, not, not long, but wide. Okay. Because you get a slower fall and okay. it flutters a lot slower. And so, um, that's what I was catching them on, on, on Rocky that day, just cause I had it tied on, but right. it was just a slower fall and, uh, and, but it didn't bite till it hit the bottom, but they followed it down to the bottom. And the minute I popped it up, they'd hit it. 
And so um, that's the biggest difference. I stay away from those big flutter spoons anytime. I've got a bunch of them hanging on the wall in my barn. Right. I don't ever fish them because they'll catch a big fish. But if you've got a school of big fish, they're only going to catch one of them. Okay, that and that's something you just learned from experience. Yeah, or? And, and from talking to other guys who guide in, in those lakes that they throw those big spoons. Right. We feel that it spooks the whole school. Oh, once, okay. Once you catch one on that big one, just for some reason, for some you reason. just don't catch very many after that. But you throw a smaller spoon in there, you can catch four or five, and then leave and come back and catch a few more. I mean, that's the only reason why I don't throw a big one. So. Okay. What about one more question on fishing? What about the drop shot in the wintertime? Something you like to do? Or, uh-huh. Yeah. I noticed you, I remember early you said drop shot. And so maybe you could give us a few little pointers on the drop shot. Um, drop shot more has to do with fish finders. Okay. You know, if I've got them suspended off the bottom underneath me, spotted bass are great at doing that in the wintertime. Right. Um, if I can see them off the bottom, I'm going to throw a drop shot. Um, now, how far off the bottom? I mean, just if there's any space underneath their bellies on the on the fish finder, gotcha, or on the down imaging, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw a drop shot down there. Okay. Um, Do you vary your leader any, or are you pretty consistent? I'll start off at 18 inches, mm-hmm. and uh, and I usually will go shorter depending on you know what. Usually, what what happens? You see them on the fish finder, and they'll be suspended off the bottom. You can catch them on you know 18 to 20 inch leaders. But then if you catch a few of them out of school, you'll see them sink back down, sink down to the bottom. And that's when I'll pull the, you know, pop the weight off and slide it up the leader and pop the weight a little bit shorter and get it closer. Or I'll grab a shaky head. You okay. know, that's any time of the year. That's spring, summer, fall, winter, whatever. If, you, if you're drop shot and you see fish underneath you and all of a sudden spotted bass will do it, sink down to the bottom. And all you see is just the, arch, the top of the arch on right. the bottom. Switch over, shorten your leader, and you'll catch them again. That's good. That's a good tip. Now, do you use the the size of the bait? Do you go smaller? What What's your max size on a drop shot? Winter time, I'm using four inch. Okay, you're going small. I go small. Yep. And, and that's just from experience, or what's your theory on that? Yeah, yeah. It's just from it, they they get a better look at it, so you want to look you want it to look as natural as possible. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to use something that looks like a minnow. I like the little tiny super fluke or the tiny flukes, the little teeny tiny mm-hmm. ones um but uh yeah it's just it all depends and you know in the summertime i'm using uh i've drop shot old old monsters really yeah and and magnum uh magnum trick worms and stuff like that in the, in the summertime but in the wintertime i'm usually small natural colors trying to look like the bait fish as much as i can and if there's a shad kill the only way you can ca- i know to catch fish is either carolina rig a fluke or a drop shot with a fluke on there where you just kind of throw it out and put the rod on the deck and eat a sandwich and drink it drink a drink and fish it like a catfish yeah you just sit there and wait and then pick it up and see if there's a fish on it and put it back down <laughs> it's the only way i know to catch it <laughs> okay we're gonna we're gonna take take notes right there on that too so let's bring it back into the fluke master itself the brand mm-hmm. and 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 the channel and everything i've noticed that you've got a you know some clothing out now and some stuff like that maybe on a website you want to talk to anybody about yeah we just uh launched relaunched flukemaster.com mm-hmm. um and uh we've gone we've gotten away from the retail side of selling baits and that kind of stuff but we uh it's the apparel you know stickers hats um shirts we're going to do a lot of this year the the plan is to do a lot of little short run really cool I got a really good graphics designer who's a buddy of mine, and he's going to basically design a shirt, and then we'll sell it for a week, and it'll be done. Limited edition. And we'll sell. Yeah, it's just going to be, we're going to have a lot of fun with that kind of stuff. I believe in great quality. Right. Um, um, and I'm not trying to make a lot of money at it. I just want to get the brand out there. And so right now, I'm just trying to pay off the website, guys. Right. Um, <laughs> and what is the name of the website? Flukemaster.com. Flukemaster.com. Yep. Yep, and it's uh, so it's real easy to remember. Uh, but it's got we've got some amazing uh, cold weather hoodies that are just sick. I mean they they got like little thumb holes you can run your thumb through, so you bring your your sleeve up to here to keep your hands right. warm and and uh, pockets inside the pocket to hold your cell phone and that kind of stuff. So we didn't we didn't skimp on the quality. Right, that's awesome. So, I mean this shirt is you know super thin. It's actually my favorite one. It's not one I would wear in the wintertime, but right. it's pretty warm today. <laughs> I got to understand. Now, looking out to 2020, maybe kind of give us a little little, you know, taste of what's going to be coming with the Flute Master in 2020. Um yeah, we've got actually, um, and I kind of alluded to it a little bit earlier, but I, I'm going to do some online courses. Mm-hmm. 
uh, video slash uh, blog style courses. Uh, they're going to be pay to play type deals, but it's going to dive into the details from beginner all the way to advanced, but it's going to be more. The, the, the trouble with YouTube is that in order to keep the whole audience interested, you can't just go step to step to step to step. You've right. got to do a beginner and then you got to do a me intermediate or an advanced and you got to, you got to play around with the seasons and stuff like that. But with a course itself, I can start you from the very beginning. And by the time you're done with the course, you can be out there catching fish. And will this come out on your website? Or? Uh, it'll be on my website. And, and, and I've still got a little bit of negotiating to do with the company that's helping me with it. Okay. So, but that's one of the things that we're, we're really focused on is trying to get that rolling. Um, I hope to have some out by spring, at least the first one. Okay. And then that's the new thing. And then uh, the Fish Finder videos. I'm having a little issue with screen flicker, uh, screen flicker on my uh, on my fish finders. Like right. One day I'll have it, one day I won't. But the settings are still the same, and it's just driving me nuts and and that kind of stuff. So I'm having a hard time getting started with those. But I got you. Well, Gene, I tell you what. Uh, from Fish North Georgia to you, we appreciate you taking the time. I know you're on your way to a hunt. Oh yeah. To stop <laughs> and uh, to speak with us for a little while, and you know it's guys like you that are inspiring us and, and we want to be able to get you out there to more people. Awesome. Not that you, you know, I'm sure you've got plenty that know you, but <laughs> if we can help you in, in, in a little way to oh, expand. Yeah. Um, but seriously on the generosity side with your information and being willing to share it like that, we think that that's the heartbeat of the fishing industry is people like you who will, who will put it out there and not have the secrets and, and, you know, and I think that's what attracts people to you. So from us to you, Thank you very much for coming oh, and talking with us. My pleasure. Absolutely. All right, man. I appreciate it. Thanks, man. Thanks. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Fish North Georgia podcast. If y'all have any topics or guests you'd like to see in the future, leave it in the comments below. Hit that subscribe button. Click that bell so that you'll be notified of any future videos. And don't forget to give us a follow on Facebook and Instagram at Fish North Georgia. And we look forward to seeing you soon.